everyone. My name is Elizabeth Argyle, and I am the Director of Guest Experience and Education at the Living Coast Discovery Center. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as part of our second nature series, which is proudly sponsored by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have been putting out a series of nature videos all about engaging with nature, and this is our third of four webinars that we are also uh, partnering with uh, these videos. And so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Tonight, we are gonna be talking all about hiking and actually getting to go and explore the wonderful habitats that San Diego has to offer. And we have a wonderful uh, uh, group of panelists that are here joining us tonight, representing all different types of areas and organizations throughout San Diego. So thank you so much to each of the panelists that have joined us this evening. We're gonna kick it off with our first panelist, which is Trish Boaz. And Trish is the executive director of the San Diego River Valley Conservancy. Her love of nature and the outdoors started very early in life and never stopped growing. Thank you so much for she's that introduction. She's fortunate to have the job she's been working for all her life. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and so thank you so much, Trish, for um, being here. And, and we look forward to hearing all about all the work that you're doing over at the San Diego River Valley Conservancy. So go ahead, Trish. All right. Well, you're wondering how early did this start? We're supposed to be talking about our passion for hiking. And I'm going to start from the very beginning. So how did it start? It all started in Mountain View. I was one of eight children. These are a few of my siblings with me piled on top of the Vista Cruiser. I don't know how many of you were the benefits of riding in the car with seven other siblings, but it was quite an experience. And the adventure getting to our spot, which was usually a national park. Here's some photos. Uh, my parents took us, we were so fortunate to go to national parks. And I also had an uncle who was a ranger in Yosemite. So that ignited my passion quite early as well. We used to wear dresses when we went hiking. We, of course, I don't do that anymore, but that's me in the upper left-hand corner with my sister, Annette, at the Grand Canyon. On the lower left, I'm in the red sweater at Yellowstone National Park, and that's Old Faithful. And then on the right is one of my favorite photos. We were the youngest of the eight. Uh, these are my sisters, Margaret and Jeanette, with me, and that is at Lower Yosemite Falls in Yosemite. So fortunately, and you know, quite, uh, you know, I guess it is fortunately, I had uh, parents that valued nature and knew what it could do for us as far as our emotional health, getting out our energy, and you know, exercise. So, where did that lead me? Well, it's going really well right now because I get to do all of the wonderful things like hiking, going out and doing biological surveys, taking photos of wildlife, and you know, discovering all the different landscapes of San Diego County. It wasn't a linear trip, let me tell you, but I did land my dream job. I landed my dream job at San Diego River Valley Conservancy in 2013 after a career at the County of San Diego and County Parks for 20 years. So the San Diego River watershed, which the Conservancy is stewards of, is about 55 miles long as a crow fly. And it's in the heart of San Diego County. Down here, you can see we're in the heart. And San Diego County is about the size of the state of Connecticut. It's a biodiverse hotspot and it traverses many different eco region, regions. So any trail that you have going through east to west in a watershed, you'll either go desert or mountains or grasslands, you know, coastal sage scrub habitat, wetlands, a different experience that not everyone in California even can enjoy. So we're very fortunate here in San Diego. So the Conservancy, um, before we get to all the hiking, you know, before you can hike somewhere, it has to be preserved as open space. 
And so one of the recent acquisitions that the Conservancy did is 117 acres right at Del Dios and right in the view shed of the existing Costa Crest Trail that travels along Del Dios Gorge and Lake Hodges. And we restore habitat in these areas. We're taking out a rundo, an ice plant, tamarisk and castor bean to make it a more enjoyable experience. Something that you can really enjoy and not you know, worry about uh, running into uh, different areas that may have uh, uh, plants that aren't beneficial to um, our health. We also have education and you wanna educate people early on because these are our future voters. These are people that vote for our bond measures that help fund the acquisition dollars that we need to buy parks, to restore trails, to build trails, and to make the experience uh, opportunity available to people of all ages, abilities, and to make it more inclusive. Conservancy has a program where we take people for an experience, hiking experience, and also get a sense of place of where they are. There are seven different areas in the watershed they go from the top at Vulcan Mountain to the coast at the San Diego Lagoon. And different experts will tell them about the botany, uh, the birds, the geology, and different uh, vegetation associated um, with different areas in the river park. But we also like to have volunteers that are citizen scientists to help us. When we buy land, for example, in the Del Dios area, we like to have people help us see what do we have there as far as herbs, you know, snakes, reptiles, what type of birds do we have there? We have mammal tracking, we uh, partner with the mammal tracking team. And we have uh, wildlife cameras out there also to help us find out what exactly is out on the properties. So for hiking specifically, and that's why we're all here tonight, right? Is our hiking experiences. This is an example of a photo that was taken during one of our Costa Crest Trail challenges up at Vulcan Mountain. And so you get the experience here of overlooking the entire river valley. And the beauty of this area near Vulcan Mountain and at the base of it is that there's actually the San Diego River headwaters as well. So this is a very important area in San Diego uh, County. Oops. Oopsie, I did it. Let me do it here. Do, 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 do. I knew this was going to happen. I have fat fingers. Okay. So here's some coastal uh, opportunities that we have at the lagoon. Uh, the San Diego Lagoon, as you know, is the, where the uh, uh, San Diego San Diego River flows through to the Pacific Ocean. And so we have a segment of the Costa Crest Trail at the lagoon, as well as a river path Del Mar that you see on the right. Now, we had a, uh, a, an issue come up a few years ago where the Coastal Commission had asked that we take out the boardwalk. But you know, these recreational facilities are important. It was put in there with grant dollars and allows people to get up close and personal with the lagoon. It's an educational opportunity for people. They learn why it's important. They learn about the different species. And so we were able to form the boardwalk, boardwalk brigade and we were able to save 600 feet of the boardwalk. And we saved the other 600 feet, the planks that were associated with that to build River Path Del Mar phase three. And right now we are in the process of the environmental review for that project. Trish, um, oh. your cameras or your screen's not sharing. If you can try resharing your screen. Okay. I'm sorry, I have fat fingers and I, I knew that was going to happen and I'm awfully sorry, but you heard what I was saying, right? So uh, right now, here is uh, what I was talking about. On the upper right-hand side is River Path Del Mar. And then here's a photo of the Boardwalk uh, Brigade that got together and saved the Boardwalk. 
And then we're going to be using those planks then to uh, traverse a portion of wet, uh, wetland area on the very edges for River Path Del Mar phase three. Now, the Coast to Crest Trail is the backbone of the San Diego River Valley and the River Park. And as I mentioned before, it starts at Vulcan Mountain here in east near Julian and traverses 55 miles as a crow flies or the trail is planned 70 mile trail. I'm going to go ahead and I'm clicking on a link here that's going to take us to a great tool. So if you're curious how much of the Costa Crest Trail is in place, how much of it can I hike right now, uh, you can go to this page um, at sdrp.org and it'll show you what the status is of the Costa Crest Trail. And I'll go ahead and just open this up so it makes it a little uh, larger for you. Hopefully it won't take its uh, time uh, coming up, but you can see the boundaries here. You can see the trail gaps are going to be shown by red lines and the completed Coast to Crest Trail that's already in um, where people can hike now, they're open to the public is in green. So right here, for instance, um, my little thing is covering Vulcan Mountain, but if we have Vulcan Mountain here, you can see we have trails in place. But as an example, we have a little gap here and that's the Lake Sutherland Mesa Grande gap. So that's not yet open to the public, but we have Santa Isabel uh, truck trail um, uh, south and down through Palmo Valley is all in place through Santa Isabel truck trail, uh, I'm sorry, north here, south here are all in place, but there's another gap here. And that gap is the East San Pasqual Valley and the Bowdoin Canyon area. And I know right now that the California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife has a management plan uh, process going on right now where they're deciding what uses can be uh, 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 done within the Bowdoin Canyon area that it owns. Hopefully it will include uh, hiking uh, as well. So then we have in place a 23 mile contiguous uh, trail uh, from Santa Fe Valley all the way to San Pasqual Valley. And then that's the longest segment. And then this little area, this little gap here is what I'm gonna talk about uh, more closely. And this is the Artesian Road um, Trail. And the Artesian uh, Road Trail uh, is going to be completed by the summer. Uh, the San Diego River Park Joint Powers Authority Rangers and I believe the San Diego Mountain Biking Association are working together to complete this gap in the trail so that you will be able to then uh, go all the way from uh, the Santa Fe uh, Valley uh, Lusardi Creek Preserve area and that little trail staging area on, uh, maybe I can make this a little bigger but on San Diego Road, all the way to San Pasqual Valley, this area right here, here's Black Mountain, okay? So you'll know this is a San Diego Road, um, San Diego Drive or San Diego Road. There's a little gap here, but there's a little trail staging area. You'll be able to go all the way to San Pasqual Valley very soon. And then the River Park Joint Powers Authority just got a grant, a 1.39 million grant to connect this area, which is um, from uh, the polo fields or the former polo fields where Surf Cup is right now. So this area right uh, through here, this is uh, where Morgan Run Golf Course is. And this is where uh, uh, we have a, a private easement from the landowner here. Uh, this is where you can go ahead and you'll be able to um, cross the river with the new bridge with the grant that they got for $1.3 million. So that's really exciting. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next uh, area. That just kind of gives you a close up of the trails that are going to be completed. Here's the Santa Fe Valley, San Diego Road, and then down to Surf Cup to El Camino Real. And in order to experience this yourself, we have the Costa Crest Trail Challenge. It is a fantastic program. It was thought up, it was a brainchild of our former conservation manager, Jess Norton in 2017. And we have had so many people complete this trail. 
We've had more than 350 people complete it each year. And it continues on to be, especially during this time, during COVID, it has been a release for so many people to get outside, to you know, get out and enjoy the outdoors. And I, every time people contact me, they have to email me their selfies at different spots, and they tell me how much it has helped them, you know, emotionally and as a family, getting outside. And so hiking to me and getting close to nature is getting closer to yourself but also getting closer to your family and those around you and building appreciation for the environment. Thanks so much, Trish, for talking about this and telling everyone about the challenge. And um, for those of you that are just joining us, we're doing a webinar here talking all about hiking around San Diego. And Trish Boaz is the executive director of the San Diego River Valley uh, Conservancy. And so um, after the rest of our panelists talk, um, we will uh, be able to open up to a Q&A. And if you guys have any questions specifically regarding this Coast to Crest Trail um, and the challenge, you can definitely let us know by um, entering it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So thank you so much, Trish, for being with us. Um, and uh, I think at this time, what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to our next panelist, Jim. So Jim Varnell is the former president of the San Diego Natural History Museum's Canyoneers, and he's a current member of the Canyoneer training team. He joined in 2013 to get back to his love of the natural world and, and share with fellow San Diegans um, all, all that San Diego has to offer. So he's led over 300 hikes for the Canyoneers. And he currently lives on a 20 on 20 acres in Ramona with plenty of opportunities to work, um, or sorry, to interact with nature and indulge in his hobby of, na of na nature photography. So Jim, thanks so much for joining us this evening and, and being part of this webinar. Oh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, thanks to everybody who's joined us tonight. Uh, Trish said a lot of things that I so agree with and I'm, going to cut my talk a little bit shorter, thanks to what she's covered. But um, I just wanted to kind of go over why I like to go out and hike in nature. And basically, it's for me, it's kind of stress relief, because when you're outside, and you're walking, and you're seeing cool things, you really can't worry about what was on the news tonight, or what you saw on social media, uh, or even what happened at work. So it's sort of a reset for me, and I just find myself so much more relaxed after I get off the trail. Uh, it also makes me feel like I'm part of a larger world or maybe even a larger universe. It, it just reconnects me with this wonderful area we live in. And uh, I also just love to go out and learn about what I'm seeing on the trail, a flower, an insect, a, a lizard, some geology. And if I'm really lucky, I get to share that with other people. And that's kind of where uh, the canyoneers come in for me. It's just, we get to go out, meet wonderful people and get to share this great area of San Diego. If you're somewhat new to hiking, you know, there, there are a couple of safety tips because nothing really ruins the hike more than having something go wrong with it. Uh, so I would just like to kind of go over what I consider uh, necessary items for a hike, like uh, always water. You can't have enough water. Uh, a hat, good shoes, sunscreen, uh, maybe a snack, especially if it's gonna be a little bit longer hike. And, and do a little research about the area you're gonna be in. Uh, Google is a fantastic resource. You can Google almost any trail or any area and find tons of information. Uh, maybe a map would be good and be prepared for weather changes. Uh, I, I've been out knowing it wasn't going to rain and, and have been rained on, so it can happen. Uh, one, great tool is to go out with somebody who already knows the trail. Uh, maybe with a hiking group, they're 
so many meetup groups in San Diego now, you should be able to find something that works for you. And that's sort of where the Canyoneers, I think, may come in for a lot of people. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. So the Canyoneers, we lead public walks throughout the county and we've been doing so. I need to update the slide. This is getting closer to 50 years. And we're associated with the San Diego Natural History Museum in Balboa Park. Uh, if you've not been there, I, <clears throat> pardon me, I would suggest you uh, at some point stop by. We're reopened now that uh, COVID is, is over or at least getting close to being over. So um, feel free to stop by anytime you're in the area. And on our walks, uh, participants get to basically just do what they wanna do. We're walking, we're talking. We don't tend to lead hikes that are getting from point A to point B as quickly as you can. We're gonna stop, we're gonna look at things that we see. We may spend a few minutes talking about a, a particular plant or maybe a bird we've seen. And we certainly encourage people to, <clears throat> pardon me, look, touch, smell, uh, talk about what they've seen, maybe share some information about something we're looking at that a canyoneer might not know. So it's just a fun, interactive uh, way to connect with nature. And for instance, some of the cool things we might see on the trail. Uh, here's a question for you. We have two pictures of a monarch butterfly there. One is a male, one is a female. And I would ask you to tell me which is which, but I won't uh, go through that process right now. And I'll simply tell you that the male on top has two little dots on its hind wing and the female is missing that. So there's a little fact we would share, or perhaps how do you tell a damselfly from a dragonfly? And in this case, when they're both stopped and sitting somewhere, the damselfly has the wings held back over its body, where the dragonfly has the wings held out to the side. Or perhaps we would talk about um, creosote perhaps out in our Ansborego Desert, our most common plant. And at the bottom, you can see the creosote and the creosote seeds. But on the top, you see a velvet ant, which to me looks like it's trying to mimic the creosote seed. Personally, I don't think that's true, but you can see why people would say that. And I should just point out the velvet ant is actually a wasp, not an ant. And uh, it has quite the sting. Its other name is cow killer. So while these are really cute, furry little things we see on the trail all the time, these are ones you want to kind of let do their own thing. And being in San Diego, we do have rattlesnakes. This is a beautiful, to me, it looks like a red diamond rattlesnake, enjoying a meal of a side blotched lizard. And as a canyoneer, I think we're very lucky if we ever see a rattlesnake. It's sort of rare, but they're beautiful animals. They're not out to get us. They would rather just stay away. So we'll enjoy them from a distance, but we won't be too worried about them. And of course, we get to see coyotes all the time. I, I see these almost every time we hike out at uh, Ramona Grasslands, there's a beautiful group out there. Fun animals, uh, Native Americans considered these sort of the uh, trickster animal. They have a lot of great stories about them. We will share those if we're out on the trail with a canyoneer hike. And of course, this area long before the Europeans showed up was the home for a lot of different uh, indigenous people. We quite often on our walks come across signs of, in this case, I believe these were kumii uh, morteros. They were used for grinding various things 
uh, acorns, seeds to make a flower. And we'll talk about these and uh, try and figure out what was being done with this particular group. And why do we do this? Well, it's because we sort of hope that, you know, even if people don't remember the name of a plant or uh, a geological formation, they'll become aware that this area needs to be conserved and preserved. And the best way to do that is to realize that we need to protect our areas. And a great quote uh, that I always love, but always have to read because I screw it up. Uh, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. So that's kind of my guiding philosophy for uh, being a canyoneer. And I hope what kind of people will take away if they're on a canyoneer hike. Now, if uh, you're interested in books, the canyoneers have written a book, Coast to Cactus, <clears throat> pardon me, Coast to Cactus, Canyoneer's Guide to San Diego Outdoors. It's about 600 pages and we, we have, I think, close to 300 hikes written up, and we give you all sorts of information about what you'll see on the hike. We give you maps, directions, pretty much everything you need to successfully go out and complete the hike. And if you wind up buying one of these books, all the proceeds go to the San Diego Natural History Museum. Easiest way is to go to Amazon and just look up Costa Cactus, and you can get a copy of this book. It covers the entire county, so you should be able to find something near you or in an area that you're interested in. And we've worked with several other organizations to uh, uh, make sure our hikes are correct and we have their approval. And if you wanna find out more about the Canyoneers, uh, you can go to uh, HTTPS sdnat.org slash canyoneers. And uh, we have a lot of other information there about our program. And let's see if I can stop sharing. And let me bring up one more. It, it's already sharing. So here we are at our Canyoneer website. And what I wanted to point out, because of COVID and not being able to lead hikes this year, we've actually been uh, writing up 10 great hikes for each season. So we have 10 great hikes for spring, for winter, for fall. And I think on Friday, we'll release our 10 great hikes for summer. And so if you go to one of these, you, amongst other things, will find 10 hikes in, that we think were good for that season. And let's just bring one of these up. And we'll tell you about the hike, distance, how easy it is, a map. And then we'll tell you all about the trail, what you might see on the trail, and more importantly, how to get there. So uh, hopefully with all of this, uh, you should be able to go out and find some great hikes everywhere in San Diego. And uh, I'm hoping this year we'll restart our Canyoneer public hikes in September and just go to the website and we'll have a list of all our hikes and how you sign up for them. They're free. So just feel free to come out and join us. Great. Thanks so much, Jim, for sharing all this information. Um, it's great to see that resource that the San Diego Nat has put together with your team. And, um, and I'm sure that you'll have a lot of, a lot of new and old um, enthusiasts uh, out there hiking with you. So I'm really excited um, for that. So thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to turn it over to our next set of panelists. Um, we have uh, Elena Flanders here from the Nature Collective. She's their volunteer director. 
And she's joined this evening tonight by Carol Monteo, who's the president of the Environmental Club at San Pasquale High School. And they've been partnering together to uphold the Nature Collective's mission of driving a passion for nature for all. So um, thank you so much, Elena and Carol, for being here tonight to share um, on the wonderful resources that you guys have and how people can partner with the Nature Collective's mission. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Um, Nature Collective and the Environmental Club at San Festival High would like to thank all of you for having us for this awesome webinar today. My name is Elena Flanders. I'm the Director of Volunteers at Nature Collective. Uh, with me today is Carol, and she is the president of the San Pasquale High School's Environmental Club. And just to give you a little bit of background, Nature Collective was founded in 1987 as a grassroots nonprofit led by a small group of passionate volunteer community members that were concerned about the health of the San Alejo Lagoon. And with that same passion, we have grown to inspire conservation action across North County, San Diego, and beyond for over three decades. We believe that if we help people discover a passion for nature, they'll wanna protect it and value everything that it has to offer. We restore habitat to provide healthier waters and greater wildlife biodiversity. We buy land and receive conservation easements so the open space will be protected in perpetuity. And we provide experiences like educational field trips, events, and tours to drive curiosity and interest in nature for everybody. So since 2013, Nature Collective has been engaging students from San Pasquale High School in weekend conservation and environmental education leadership activities. And this mentorship program, it requires students to commit to weekends where they engage with and serve as role models to youngsters visiting the lagoon. These students also participate in bi-monthly cleanups, hikes, and even rock climbing and kayaking adventures. So Carol, who's with us today. She is the president of the Environmental Club and she is here to share with everybody today, um, for starters, how and why she personally connects to nature through hiking. Carol, take it away. Hello, so as Elena said, my name is Carol and I'm a senior at San Pasquale High School. Um, and the way I connect to nature is just being outdoors. It really brings out the best in me. And I think that's for everyone, you know, just being out in nature, just experiencing life. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I love being outdoors and just getting to breathe in fresh air and look at everything around me and just realize that I'm um, a part of this big world. Like we all, we can, we can all do our part in just um, embracing the beauty of it. So yeah, that's how I connect through hiking. Thanks for sharing, Carol. I totally agree. Um, nature just makes me happy. I feel like it makes other people happy too. Um, one thing that I always try to do when I'm out on a hike is I take a few moments of silence. Um, if I have the time, I like to climb a tree if I can. I know some trees are protected, so you have to watch out for that, but climb a tree or rock or just sit somewhere and enjoy. And I like to sort of use all of my senses and just take it all in and appreciate the beauty all around me. Um, I like to listen to the sounds of the birds chirping or the wind blowing, like leaves rustling. And then I'll just take a deep breath. We don't often do that, right? And just smell like the different scents, like the trees and the soil or um, even animals. Sometimes you can smell. I was, I was out on a hike um, last week and I thought I smelled deer, which is weird. It was like an animal smell. And what do you know? We saw some like right around the corner. It was super cool. Um, and then I like to feel the ground beneath me. So if you're sitting, you can even use your hands and just like touch the soil or are you on a rock or a tree? Is it uneven? Um, and just look around. What do you notice? Sometimes just slowing down, um, you'll get to notice things that you might've quickly passed by. Um, that's one way I like to connect to nature when I'm out on a hike. Um, but before we share with you, we're gonna share with you how to prepare for one of our favorite hikes in San Diego. I'd like to give you a little bit of background about both of us. So Carol is a little bit newer of a hiker, but she has taken a ton of adventures all throughout the Escondido Creek watershed. There's lots of um, shorter day hikes, trips that you can take all throughout that watershed. Um, I personally have some experience with single day hikes um, and a little bit of multi-day backpacking trips. 
Um, some would include um, hiking Mount Whitney, the Trans Catalina Trail. I've done a few section hikes along the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, and of course, all of our local mountain ranges like San Gregorio or Baldy or San Jacinto. Um, but after this program, if you're still unsure how or where to begin hiking, please, I encourage you to reach out to me. I would love to help you. It can be overwhelming and sometimes it can be a little bit scary, um, but it shouldn't be at all. So you just need to contact the right people and get with the right group and get out there and have fun. All right, so we thought that we would share with you uh, one of our favorite trails. It's located off Rios Avenue in Solana Beach. This trail, Annie's Canyon, it's a super hidden gem. There's these narrow sandstone walls that you have to like crawl through. It's like nature's hugging you. You have to like squeeze through the canyon. I love it so much. Um, it's a true slot canyon, which is pretty cool. So the first steps to prepare for a hike is you wanna do some research about the trail. So you can find lots of information about this trail on the Nature Collective's website. So I'd encourage you to go there if you're planning to visit, but we're gonna go through everything with you right now. So you would be prepared to just go and visit after our little, after our little info sesh. Um, so for starters, um, for starters, you wanna know the difficulty level of the trail. So Annie's Canyon, it's an easy trail with strenuous portions. So the trail is fairly level. Um, it's along the edge of the lagoon. So the strenuous part is climbing up through the slot canyon. Um, and this can be uh, a little bit strenuous, but there's some steps and there's even a ladder to help you to get to the top. Um, once you get there, you have the option of going through the canyon or not. So you can always change your mind and decide if you're unsure if you wanna go right through. Let's see, it's about 1.4 miles round trip which should take you approximately 40 minutes to complete. Um, and you can visit any time during daylight hours. So it's also good to note that there are no restrooms. So you might wanna go to the closest park if you're traveling a longer distance um, when you're getting to your hiking destination. So something to think about when you're going hiking. So the closest bathrooms for this hike are located at the beach, which is just down the road and it's called Fletcher's Cove. So you could stop there and use the restroom if you feel like you need to go. Um, leash dogs are welcome, but you wanna keep in mind, they are not able to climb through the slot canyon. It is a little bit narrow. Um, so keep that in mind when you're visiting. And then lastly, there's a lot of street parking available at the trailhead, but you don't need a permit. And um, that's most of the items that you wanna know before heading off on any adventure. So these are things you would wanna look up for any hike prior to heading out there. But now that you know all about the trail, Carol's going to share with everyone a couple of next steps in pre getting prepared to head out on a hike. Yeah, so when you're preparing for a hike, you know, you want to be wearing the right clothing. So if it's like a rainy day, you know, you want to have like a raincoat or an umbrella. Um, but also like if it's a hot day, then you want to be wearing something uh, more comfortable where you're not as um, warm, I guess. Uh, but you also want to have like your sunscreen on because it's going to be very warm and the sun is still um, hitting you even if it's cloudy. So that's important. And then, you know, always have a water on you because you're going to be walking for a lot of, um, for many miles if you do it on a long hike. Um, but then also bring a snack just in case you want to stop and like take in everything. Um, and then also knowing what kind of plants or wildlife you might see. Um, you would just want to keep in mind of um, not disturbing any um, animals, also plants, um, leaving things, you know, you don't want to be picking like leaves or flowers, you know, just leaving everything there. Um, but also being mindful of poisonous plants or poisonous animals. Um, but yeah, I think that's about everything. And then the leave no trace, take only pictures, leave only footprints. Um, it's kind of like our motto, like you wanna be going through the hike, you don't wanna be leaving anything or taking anything. You wanna just pick up trash if you leave, if you leave it or if you see it. Um, and you wanna be respectful of the wildlife there. And you just wanna stay on the trail. You don't wanna go off course and disturb like animals that are nearby, but yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Carol, for sharing those super important tips. So things to think about if you're heading out on your first adventure or you're kind of new to hiking. 
Um, it's always good to make sure you're aware of all these different aspects that we just shared with you. Um, but if you are thinking about taking it to the next level, here's a quick list. It looks kind of like a long list, but of things to bring to prepare you for uh, your adventure. So I thought I'd go over this quickly. For starters, you want to make sure to tell someone where you'll be and how long. Have an end communication time with them. So if that person doesn't hear from you, they know to go ahead and call for help. Uh, make sure that you have the correct permits and parking passes. If you're planning to visit a national park, it'd be worth getting an America the Beautiful Pass. If you're staying local, you could just purchase an adventure pass. And it can get a bit confusing and or overwhelming when you first start getting into all of this. But again, I'm here to help you. So honestly, if you have any questions at all, um, I would love to be a great resource to get you out on some new hiking adventures. Um, lastly, always have a map that can be accessed without a mobile connection. So this could be printed or copied, a copy to bring with you um, or saved on your phone so that you can access it offline. And then for a single day trip, uh, just make sure you bring a cell phone. If it's a longer trip, I always bring a survival blanket, a few first aid um, items, a fire starter, a knife, a whistle and a light and um, a jacket, just sort of like an extra layer, just to be safe. All these items are super light and very easy to carry. Uh, for a longer trip, more gear and planning is required. Um, I just got back from a four and a half day adventure race throughout Oregon, and this was the first time that I actually used all of my emergency gear, and I was so, so thankful that I had it. But whatever hiking level you are, there's fun adventures waiting for you. If you have any questions, again, please contact me. I would love to help to get anybody out on some new trails, whatever your level or comfort is. Um, and then lastly, we wanna invite you to join us to inspire everyone to connect and experience and protect nature by becoming a volunteer ambassador. So as a volunteer ambassador, you can help welcome visitors of all ages when they experience um, Annie's Canyon, Swami's Beach or Seaside State Beach. And the volunteers provide information and highlights about the plants and animals that live there and provide guidance on how to enjoy the natural world in a sustainable way. Um, so we would love for you to visit our website, check it out. Let me know if you wanna be a volunteer and of course stay connected and um, messages, feel free to message us at any time. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Elena, and also Carol for being here to share about your experiences um, with the Nature Collective. And it's so exciting to see all the work that your organization is doing. And uh, this is such a great transition to our last panelist. Um, but before I introduce him, um, I am gonna just remind uh, those of you that are just joining us tonight for this webinar. This is the Living Coast Discovery Center's Second Nature Series, and we are doing a webinar tonight all about hiking. And so we do want to encourage you um, to use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen if you have questions for the panelists, because um, after our final panelist uh, speaks tonight, we will um, open it up to all four of them and kind of round robin some answers um, based on what the audience is is curious about. So please use that uh, Q&A feature. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our last panelist, uh, Rick Romine. Uh, Rick is an outdoor enthusiast uh, that's been leading backpacking treks and teaching outdoor skills to both youth and adults for over 15 years. He's also the founder of the wilderness education site, howtowilderness.com. He is a certified wilderness first responder, a commercial backpack guide, and a member of BAMRU, which is a mountain search and rescue team. So um, if it sounds like he has a lot um, on his plate, he does because he's guided trips to uh, national parks through the US, Joshua Tree, Yosemite, Yellowstone, uh, Mount Rainier, and he's even um, done the British Columbia and Patagonia, uh, Chile. Um, and he's also hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in 2015, the Sierra High Route in 2016, and the Tahoe Rim Trail in 2018. Whew, man, Rick, you are busy. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being here tonight and, uh, and for sharing all about your um, hiking and backpacking adventures. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna switch to share mode, is that all right? Yeah.
Okay, is that sharing? Hopefully yes, it, it looks great. All right, great, thank you. Um, so Stephen Wright, a comedian once said, uh, everywhere is within walking distance if you have enough time. Um, and that really sort of fits with the character of through hiking. If you look at that picture on the left-hand side, that's the Southern terminus of the Pacific Coast Trail in San Diego County, right on the Mexican border. Uh, on the right is the Northern terminus, which is on the uh, Canadian border. Um, the distance between by trail between those two posts is 2,650 miles. In time for me, it was five months. So that kind of fits the theme of everywhere is within walking distance if you have the time. So if you look big picture at the Pacific Crest Trail, it goes all the way from San Diego all the way up through Washington. And when you think about taking on something as big as this kind of a trail, um, I think about it in sort of four different dimensions. One is end to end. If you don't get up every day thinking I'm going to Canada, you probably aren't gonna make it. Um, but I also think of it in terms of sections and the sections are really uh, almost ecosystems. Uh, what kind of challenges are you gonna face? What kind of wilderness are you gonna be a part of? What kind of animals are you gonna see? Uh, so the desert area that San Diego represents is very different than the Sierra Mountains. It's very different than uh, parts of Oregon. So those are kind of the sections. The other thing you think of is resupply. When's the next place along this trail that I'm going to be able to get the stuff that I need? And it's mostly food, but it's also other things. Um, and then the other thing is you think of it each day. Each day you wake up and you think, where am I going to get water? and where am I gonna to sleep tonight? Um, many people think that taking on a big kind of trail like this is uh, very physical. Um, it is, um, but it's also very mental. It's, it's a mental activity. I, I, so I say, you know, way more mental. And I'm, since I'm mental, it works well for me. Um, there is a cult, oops, sorry. Uh, logistics. A lot of people talk about logistics. I won't go into any more details on what you should bring when you're out in the wilderness. However, to say that when you're doing a long hike, you're thinking that uh, I'm going to be carrying this stuff for 2,650 miles. I'm going to be carrying this stuff for over 6 million steps. Um, there's an expression, what you carry on your back are your fears. So when you're a through hiker, when you're someone who's trying to go ultra light because you're going really far and you got to do a lot of miles every day, every item before you put it in your pack, you take it out and you look at it and you say, is there a smaller version of this? Is there a lighter version of this? Do I really even need this? And it's all about your fears. Some of your fears will be legitimate. I need food, I need water, those are legitimate. Um, some fears might be, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to get poison oak. I'm afraid I'm going to get attacked by a bear. I'm afraid I need a giant, you know, the more skills and experience you have, you can put that in your head and you don't have to carry it. There's also on a through hike, a culture. Um, you're probably going to need some help. Uh, the culture is to hike your own hike. That's sort of an overarching theme of all through hikers. You're out there for your reason with your equipment and your ideas. Uh, don't judge other people on what they're doing and why they're, uh, they're doing it. It's really hike your own hike. Um, but there is uh, things in the culture that are very helpful. Um, trail magic. Trail magic is when you get something from the trail at about the time you need it. It might be water at a water cache. So this water cache right here, you're seeing in that picture that my son is sitting in front of, uh, that's in San Diego County. Um, but it might be someone meeting you at a crossing of a road saying, Do, would you like an apple? Um, it might be you're feeling really down and you turn around a corner and there's a mama bear and her cubs and suddenly your heart is warmed and you're ready to keep, you know, to keep going. But trail magic is what the trail gives you when you need it. Trail angels, those are the people that do that. Um, they might be someone who opens up their home and allows you to come in and gives you a pancake breakfast. They might be someone who just hands you a piece of cheese on the trail, but trail angels provide that. Um, also in the culture is trail names. 
So if you're going to be on a trail for five months, you're going to pass people, you know, many, many times in the five month period, um, you start to take on sort of a personality and identity. And usually that gets reflected in a trail name. Your trail name, you know, might be Mama Bear or Java Bean or uh, I hiked with a guy named Grenade and he was called Grenade because every time he opened up his pack, it looked like a grenade had exploded. His stuff went everywhere. <laughs> So these are the sections, main sections that we went through. Um, first section obviously is the desert section. Um, that starts in San Diego. So there's probably uh, somewhere in San Diego County, I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 133 uh, miles of trail. Um, when you're facing the desert, you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm worried about heat. I'm worried about wind. I'm worried about rattlesnakes and I'm worried about water. Um, and all those things are true, but it's amazing how, uh, how much there's still mountains and hills and things that don't feel like a caricature of, you know, cartoon character of a, uh, of a desert. Um, water though is important and that bottom uh, screen, uh, you see a picture of a little, looks like a cesspool almost. Um, that's actually in Joshua Tree near Joshua Tree National Park where they do a lot of uranium mines. Um, so the sign in front of that little water pit says uh, water not safe for drinking. Um, I will tell you um, one thing about uranium water is um, it's delicious. So if you're really needing water, I drank that water. Um, this is the Sierra section. So in the Sierra section, you sort of flip now. Now you're, now you're not worried about lack of water, you're worried about too much water. There's snow, there's snow coming down, there's sleet, there's rivers that are overfloating, there's streams you have to forage where you're like picking up your pack over, you know, and walking through water over your waist. Um, there's also amazing mountains and vistas. Um, the highest point on the entire trail is Forester Pass, which is the sign I'm standing next to, that's uh, Forester uh, Pass. Um, one requirement here is you have to have bear canisters because you do see bears and that adds extra uh, weight. This is the Northern California section. For me, this section actually was the hardest section. Um, and because it's a mental game, you'd gone through the desert, you'd made it through the, uh, you know, the mountains and the Sierra, and now you're ready to move into Oregon. There's a long distance between the Sierra Mountains ending and Oregon starting. Um, so keeping yourself mentally going through that Northern California section is kind of tough. Um, also, surprisingly, you get into some dry sections where water can be an issue. You may have to do a lot of night hiking. Um, and Mount Shasta over there is so visible for so long, it's frustrating because you feel like you're, as long as you keep seeing Shasta, you know you haven't gotten out of California. The next section is the Oregon section. Um, this is where people really have their legs now. Um, they can really move, get some distance in. You're, maybe you're doing 30 miles a day instead of 20 miles a day. Um, that's uh, Crater Lake and uh, Tunnel Falls. Uh, one thing about Oregon is you run into a lot of lava, um, which is spectacular looking, but eventually you realize it really rips up your shoes and your feet pretty good, um, but it is uh, spectacular. This is the Washington section. So this is, you know, you're on the home stretch now, all right? You've been on the trail for four plus months and now it's a race because the Northern Cascades, the days are getting shorter, the storms are coming in. And if you've spent four and a half months out here and now the storms come in and you don't make it to that Canadian border, that's really frustrating. Um, so this is a lot like the Sierras and the elevations and the spectacular vistas. Um, and the bears, uh, but, uh, but it's a, it's a kind of a race to the finish. Uh, resupply, um, that's something that you have to do that's different than the kind of hiking we've been talking about. You might have to do a lot of hitchhiking to get to a resupply. You're desperate for calories and you're looking to clean up your clothes and uh, um, you know, do laundry. Um, on a typical day, you're waking up and you're thinking, how, where's the next campsite? Where's the next water? Oh, there's a campsite in 18 miles, but looks like there might be another one in 24 miles. I don't know, what do I feel like today? Do I feel like an 18 mile day or a 24 mile day? Um, 
you do a lot of eating of food while you're on the trail. You don't want to stop and spend a whole lot of time. So a lot of it is uh, what I would call snack packing where you're eating on the run. Um, this is the San Diego section. So this is your home turf. You are the starting point for the Pacific Crest Hill. Obviously way more people start in San Diego than make it to uh, Canada. Um, these pictures over here, that's my son. Uh, we came out of the desert and got into Laguna Mountain and he was so excited to see a tree. So he's hugging a tree. Um, that is uh, Julian apple pie with ice cream. And some of you probably recognize maybe uh, Eagle Rock, which is also uh, right on that trail. Um, so you don't have to bite off the whole trail. Um, you could do sections. You can do sections within the San Diego area. You can do San Diego as a section. Um, my one word of caution though, perhaps is uh, be careful because once you start walking, you just might keep walking um, and you'll find yourself uh, in Canada. So I'm trying to get us back on schedule here, Elizabeth, so. No, that's great. Um, thank you so much for uh, doing that and for talking about that. Um, it's uh, it's very exciting to see to see the whole trail in, in action and and how San Diego County is just one part of it and uh, and everything. So um, thank you to all of our panelists who have uh, joined us this evening. We do have a few questions that are um, trickling in from those that are still with us. Uh, and so one of them was specifically asking about Annie's Canyon and its accessibility to maybe people that are a little bit bigger um, because they are, you know, smaller slot canyons. So Elena, since you talked about. Yeah. Slot um, canyons, do you know anything about Annie's Canyon and, and other slot canyons? I sure do. Um, yes, I would, it's, it's not that uh, it's narrow, but um, I would say assess when you get there and decide for yourself, if you want to go through it, the actual slot canyon is not that long of a distance. Um, and it's pretty much, the start of it, it, it stays about the same width all the way up. So if you're assessing from the bottom and think you can go up, it would be fine. I don't, I haven't heard of anybody actually having any issues going through there. Um, if you get to the bottom of the slot canyon and you still wanna hike up to the top because there's a really cool view, there's another way to go around like a switchback trail up to the top. So there's options if you go there and you decide you don't wanna go through. Great, thanks for that information. Um, we also had another question coming in um, specifically to the PCT. So this is for Rick um, asking about um, they want to get started on this. And um, and so they were wondering what are kind of your tips for for getting started on on getting prepared and, and actually being ready to go on the PCT. Um, and then a follow-up question about being interested in search and rescue and, and learning more about that. So can you talk a little bit about well, that? Uh, the, uh, the first part, I think, you know, getting uh, associated with the, all the other organizations that were represented here would be a great start, right? They represent uh, hiking resources uh, and knowledge resources. Um, part of it is just getting in shape. Um, the other big part though, really uh, for me is it's mental. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to hike 20 miles for one day, but it's another thing to get up and do it again and get up and do it again and get up and do it again. Um, and what's gonna be in your head all day long. Um, so part of it is really about uh, the motivation for doing uh, the trail. Um, but all kinds of people do it. A lot of people do it who have no backpacking experience at all. They're just looking for an adventure. Um, uh, search and rescue, uh, it's just kind of funny. I do education on the front end, I guide people, and then after I've screwed up the education or I've lost them on guiding, I, then I go back out as a search and rescue to find them, I guess. Um, I'm on a, a team that's called uh, Bay Area Mountain Rescue, and we they focus on uh, rescues above 7,000 feet in elevation. So they're usually a mutual aid call in for a sheriff department. So it's, it's not usually a normal uh loss it's usually one at, at it's probably at high elevation so but there's uh, all, there's search and rescue teams that are associated with every sheriff in every county so you could certainly get uh you know connected with a search and rescue team in san diego county for sure with the through the sheriff great 
Um, and then uh, just a question for everyone, I guess, is um, uh, going out in nature and everything, what, what has been like your biggest thing that's kind of kept you going and, and, um, and why you keep going back? I know you guys all kind of touched on why you got started and everything, but what's, what keeps you going um, back into the, these hikes and, and visiting nature more? So uh, Jim, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Well, it's funny for me, while nature is spectacular, the people you get to meet when you're out in nature are fantastic. Uh, it's sort of like it's a self-selected group of people who you can be friends with within two minutes of starting to walk. So for me, that's really it. I just love meeting people who have the same mindset that I do. And we want to learn. We want to explore. We just want to have fun out in nature. Uh, Trish, what about you? What keeps you going back? Keeps me going back is the fulfillment I get from being outside you know, and, you know, Jim mentioned it before, it's a getaway from all the hub and bub and all the uh, things that are going on in the, in the world. And you're out there and you're taking in what is most important. It's a time to think, as Elena said, to reflect, uh, you know, and really get your thoughts together and regroup and refresh. That's what keeps me going out as well as the nature. Great. Um, Elena, what's your what's your favorite hike in San Diego um, to visit? That's such a hard question. How can I even answer that? <laughs> um, well, we, we showcase Annie's Canyon a lot. If you haven't visited there, it's a really cool hike. It's a short hike. It's a totally hidden gem hike. Um, I love going up to the mountains. Um, I love going to Mount Baldy, um, kind of taking the back the back trail, the old trail, um, instead of the highly populated trail. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I don't know. That's such a hard question. That whole section of the PCT, I have done that in sections, the 133 miles, um, with some friends and we chunked it out into like 30 mile sections and just did them on a day and a weekend. All the sections are beautiful and so different. So that's a kind of a cool experience. You can definitely get it done, um, without having to backpack if you're not comfortable backpacking and then going with friends. So I don't know, so many options. And Carol, what about you? What's been your favorite hike that you've gotten to do with the Nature Collective? Um, with Nature Collective, I feel like I haven't done many, but just with my family on, my, on our own, there's a trail, I think it's a mountain bike trail. It's in San Pasqual uh, Valley. And we usually go on that um, trail whenever, you know, the weather's nice, but I really just like going up there and then like going to the top of the mountain and just seeing the valley. It's really nice. So, great. Um, Rick, we had another question come in that's asking if you're planning to go back on the PCT or if you would do any part of it again. If if my son wanted to do it, if one of my sons wanted to do it, I would definitely do that. What I would like to do personally is I like to do the Continental Divide Trail next. Uh, a little bit longer, a little bit less populated, um, but still a similar kind of experience. Um, but, you know, kind of like Jim said, it's the people too, you know, who are you going to be with? Because um, you can, you can enjoy anywhere if you're with the right people. Yeah. Great. Well, that's uh, just a great way to end this. And um, thank you to all the people that were here tonight to join us and especially to our wonderful group of panelists that were here this evening um, to uh, answer people's questions and uh, share a little bit more about the great resources we have here in San Diego. So we just wanna say thanks again for joining us for our second nature series. Please check out uh, the other videos and webinars that have already gone live and we have a couple more coming in June. And uh, please uh, check out these great resources that um, we've uh, you know, rallied together this evening between the Natural History Museum, getting to go out with the Kenyan years, or visiting the Nature Collective and volunteering at one of the trailheads, or the San Diego River Valley Conservancy doing that um, crest to coast to crest trail, crest to coast trail challenge, and just getting out. So 
thank you again, everyone, and, uh, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.